Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Committee for Sydney Live. And today we've got a, a, a really special event, an opportunity for us to say thank you and farewell to Elizabeth and McGregor. We'll get to that in a minute, but uh, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the places that we're joining from this morning. I'm joining from Gadigal land, so I acknowledge the Gadigal people and I pay respect to their elders past and present. And I know that you join me in paying respect to the elders from all the places that you are joining from and also to the elders from the places where uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today are uh, joining from. I'd also, before we start, like to thank uh, the innovation partners of the Committee for Sydney. These are members of the committee that provide additional support to us to enable us to do our important work uh, and also to present events like the one we're presenting today. And they are Campbelltown City Council, DEXIS, the ICC Sydney, McKinsey and & Company and Western Sydney University. We thank them for their generous support of our work. In 1999, Elizabeth Ann McGregor came to Sydney to become the director of the Museum of Contemporary Art. When she arrived, the museum was eight years old, and I think to be fair, it was struggling to find its place in Sydney and to find its audience in Sydney. 22 years later, Lizanne is stepping down, and she does that after having achieved incredible things for the MCA as an institution. Um, but also achieving incredible things for contemporary arts and cultural life in Sydney and for Sydney's place in the contemporary art world. She doesn't really need a long introduction, so I'm not really going to give her one, um, but um, I think it's fair to say that Lizanne has played as big a role as anyone in the last 10 years in bringing Sydney to the world's attention. And that's something that we recognised uh, just last week when she received our inaugural Global Sydney Award in uh, the Committee for Sydney's Sydney Awards. Lizanne, it's great that you're here. Um, thanks for making some time for us today. Good morning. Morning, thank you, Michael. And I would like to thank the Committee for Sydney and the judges for giving me that incredible award. In my, my final weeks as the director, it's a huge accolade to be recognised for, um, for my work by the peers in the committee. So thank you for that. Well, in addition to the award, we wanted to host a really big party where all our members and friends came along, um, probably to your place, and, and said thank you to you. Uh, and that's not to be. So uh, instead, we're going to have this conversation this morning, and I hope uh, it's an opportunity. Oh, champagne. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm already drinking, so but I hope it's a real opportunity for um, people to hear a few things from you about your time. Uh, with the MCA and in Sydney, and also an opportunity for people to ask some questions later when we get to the Q&A. So let me start back in, in 1989. What, and I think you were in Birmingham in 1989, uh, sorry, 1999. Yeah, 1999. So what was it that um, made you say yes, besides perhaps a Birmingham winter? <laughs> well, you know, Birmingham, a view of the Opera House. Uh, you know, I've been there for 10 years. I just opened a new building. I, I was actually really looking forward to running the icon for a bit longer. Um, but eventually after um, John Caldor, Simon Mordant, a number of people, um, and I, my great mentor and friend, Sir Nicholas Sirota, um, various discussions about where next for me. And I thought, well, Sydney is a pretty interesting option. Um, and the museum, of course, as everybody knows, was having was struggling, having opened with a huge accolade at the beginning of the decade. It had run into financial issues for a whole range of reasons, most of it not of its own making. Um, as I discovered, um, it was very much a football in the in the in the hands of various interested parties around the city. And so I, I relished the challenge of taking on an institution in an incredible part of the world. And I had been here. I'd been to Australia, I think, three times um, and had become very interested in the artists here. I would not have come here if the stereotype of Australia as only interested in football had been true. Um, I, I had shown a number of Australian artists, particularly the late great artist Gordon Bennett, who I did a big solo show of. So it was a combination, I guess, of a great institution really needing a, a new direction and great, great um, interest in the art that brought me here. And, and, and what did you find 
when, <laughs> when you arrived. Um, is, it, is it what you expected? Is it more than you expected? Well, funnily enough, yesterday I happened to be in the office for various reasons and I was clearing out my desk and I found this huge pile of press cuttings that someone kindly sent me just before I arrived. And it was pretty horrifying to think back on. There were headlines like, a great museum, shame about the art. And the gallery that nobody goes to. Uh, last chance for the MCA. And there's a great one that says the stench must go. I'm not quite sure what that one referred to. And my favourite, which I think was the Sunday Telegraph, which was uh, when the, the museum got a one-off bailout from the state government, money for wankers. <laughs> yeah, so I was a little, uh, little concerned about this. And when I got here, what was really fantastic, though, was the amazing um, group of supporters um, that really wanted the institution to, to survive. You know, people like John Calder and Simon Mordant, Cynthia and Ted Jackson, the Gr Ginny Green, the daughter of, 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 of Lottie Smorgan, who had given us that amazing collection. So there was a really good feeling and, and there was an amazing staff. You know, there were, there'd been a terrible restructure. A lot of people had gone, but it, it, there was a real sense that Sydney needed to have an institution like the MCA from, from a core group of people. The wider community was a bigger problem because, of course, they were just reading those headlines. And so the stereotypes of it being elitist, not for everybody, um, you had to have an art, a degree in art history to understand what was going on, or worse, it's all a load of rubbish. And, and I have to say that the mainstream critics were, were pretty vicious and pretty un, un, unforgiving of a, a museum that was struggling to find its way. So it was a, it was a, it was challenging, but. I have dealt with the British tabloids. And let me tell you, there is no such thing in Australia. Not even the talk show hosts are as bad as the British tabloids. So, so you said that one of the things that brought you here was the, the interest you'd already developed in the contemporary art scene in Australia. Um, and yet you arrived to a museum um, that's seen as remote and elitist and is, is, is not really attracting its audience. Um, what was happening there? Was was there something that you could see that um, Sydney wasn't seeing in itself, or was the museum just not making the invitation? What what? It was. I think it's a combination of factors. I, I think the museum's numbers had dropped to below a hundred thousand a year, so there weren't many people coming in to see what contemporary art is. And so people were getting their, their views of it through the media lens of it all being a load of rubbish or too difficult or you know not what the man in the street or the woman in the street wants to see. Um, all those stereotypes that I was well used to from the UK. But there was incredible art, you know, like, I mean, I'm looking at what's behind you right now, Michael, you know, we put on an amazing show of work from Man and Greta at one point, and I, I finished up on the on page three, I think, of the, of the Telegraph saying, look at this incredible work, not enough people are seeing this, and one of the reasons is we're charging, we need to be free. And this was the this was my thing. We had to get more people in to the museum to engage with the work. And our job, my job, was to actually bridge that gap between what the public thought the museum was doing and what the museum was actually doing, which was really fantastic. There were great shows. There was some really interesting things that happened long before I got there. But there was just this piece missing about engaging with that broader audience. And ultimately, of course, the politicians who were who who we really needed to 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 get behind us to to give us the support and there was the university of sydney which was not playing i have to say a great role at this point it was pulling its money out and that was destabilizing the museum without any real understanding of what it would take to replace that money so lizanne in the in the last uh, two answers that you gave you touched on two things that i want to really um i hoped we would get to talk about today um, you used the phrase art is for everyone or art is for everybody. And um, uh, I think that's been a guiding principle of yours at the MCA. And you also um, touched on um, how we see Indigenous art in Australia. So let's let's talk about um, those two in reverse order. So let's start. <laughs> um, I think one of the one of the great achievements of your time has been to encourage people to see Australian Indigenous art as contemporary art, to, under, to understand that it's been created by people now. Um, uh, Absolutely. Tell us, about, tell us about how you think um, we've come on that journey with you. 
Well, I was intrigued by this because the museum actually had taken a stance on this right from the very beginning. The museum has had an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander board member right since its inception. And the Man and Greeda collection I referred to earlier was one of the first collections that came to the museum in a groundbreaking agreement whereby the museum does not own the work. It's kept in trust in a sense for the community. There's an agreement that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. So I was intrigued by this and the fact that there was such an incredible diversity of work from Gordon Bennett, all these amazing Tracy Moffat. Tracy was one of the first artists I met when I came on an exploratory trip. Um, right through to the work from, from, from regional communities, remote communities. And I was really interested in how that should be positioned. That's taken a long time to shift perceptions internationally. And one of the things I'm most proud of is that only three months ago, the first Bark painting has entered a museum of modern art, and that is the Tate Gallery in London. Um, because that kind of Aboriginal art, the Bark paintings, the Western Desert paintings, were not regarded as contemporary. It was much easier for international organisations to understand urban Aboriginal art, which has um, many, um, like, if you like, international peers looking at colonialism in, in Britain, for example, um, African Caribbean artists, Asian artists in Britain, different, but looking at similar issues from a different angle. So it was much easier for the international art world to respond to that. The kinds of work I'm talking about, you know, now that from remote communities was much harder because it couldn't be easily fitted into what was regarded as the story of modern art. So I think one of the things that the MCA has achieved is to outside Australia, get that recognized. Um, many private collectors have been buying Aboriginal art for a long time, but the major museums have not. And so I, I think that's really a big, a big step forward. I agree, I agree. Um, so let's go to artists for everybody. Um, uh, again, I think um, in, in my mind, the outstanding achievement of the MCA over the last 20 years is it's, it's, a, it's outreach to everyone in Sydney, it's invitation to everyone in Sydney and the, it's programs that provide access to the museum for, mm -hmm. for the broadest possible range of people. How did, how did that start? And, and perhaps for people who don't know about it, you can um, say a little bit about where it is today. <laughs> well, um, I have to say a little bit about my days as a bus driver. I began my career driving an art bus in Scotland. And I became very passionate about the possibility to reach everybody with art. Now, when I say art is for everyone, I always put a, a bit of a corollary on that, which is art is for everyone if they choose to engage with it. And the job of the museum is to make that engagement as easy and accessible as possible. Not making the art more accessible. I had many hilarious conversations when I first came from people who said, if only you would do things that were more recognizable. If only you would show things that I would know about them. Art about cars or art about this or art about that. And I held very strongly to the belief that we have to start with the artists. We have to show the art that the most interesting contemporary artists in our view are producing. And so to change the dynamic away from making the art more popular to making the museum popular as a venue. And that means people may come in and not like everything, that's fine. They may find things that they, that they have trouble dealing with, but we need to give them the tools and the information to make up their own minds. We won't win everybody over. But to, to have an attitude that art can be for everyone has been incredibly important. I have to say, I remember visiting the MCA in the mid nineties and like many contemporary museums at the time, the front of house staff were simply not very friendly. You kind of felt like you shouldn't be there. And I was an art history student and I can remember that feeling when I went to contemporary galleries and I hated it. It was like, you felt like an idiot. Even though I was an intelligent art history student, you were put off uh, contemporary art galleries because they, were, they, they seemed to be much um, more complicated and, and unwelcoming essentially. Someone would look at you, there's a wonderful, absolutely fabulous sketch where one of them goes in, I think Jennifer, uh, Joanna Lumley goes into a contemporary art gallery and the person looks at her like she's you know, trodden in something because she shouldn't be there. She's not the right kind of person. 
And she turns around and goes, you know, drop the attitude, it's just a shop. You know, it was a, a contemporary uh, a, a gallery. And so that kind of attitude really was pervasive in the, in the, in the 80s and 90s in the contemporary art world. Um, that had been challenged a lot around the world. And I wanted to do that with the museum is to change it. So the front of house team became the most important part of the museum to, to have people who were welcoming and friendly and knew a little bit about the art, not necessarily experts, but enough to answer some basic questions or to direct someone. And so that visitor experience piece, which sounds very obvious, became incredibly important, as did reaching out to people who you wouldn't expect to come. So one of my first collaborations in Western Sydney was with the Penrith Panthers, because I didn't see why uh, a postcode should determine why you were interested in art. You know, you didn't have to live in the eastern suburbs. And so Western Sydney became a really important part of us demonstrating that we could and should reach a very broad demographic. Um, one of my highlights at the MCA every year is the um, celebration of the Bella program. And um, I'm always struck, uh, and I'll, I'll ask you just to explain that program to people who, who might not know about it, but I, I'm, I'm always struck uh, each year by um, some of the parents of school children who who, when they're talking about the program, um, mention that they came to the museum with their children. And it wasn't just the first time they'd been to the MCA. It was the first time they had seen the Opera House or the Harbour Bridge. Uh, and you, you, had, you had created um, a, a reason for people to be moving around the city in ways that they, they hadn't before. Do you want to just talk a little bit about what the objectives of that program uh, mm. were and what you think some of the unintended um, and, and beautiful benefits have been? Well, the Bella program began for children, specifically children from, uh, well, actually it began in Mount Druitt. The very first Bella program was a one day workshop in Mount Druitt that was funded by the, by the great, late great Ted Jackson and his wonderful wife, Cynthia, who is still of course a great um, supporter of the museum. And it was, it was really about access, about giving children who may not have opportunities, the opportunity to engage with art and particularly artists. Since we opened our fabulous National Centre for Creative Learning in 2012, we've provided facilities to bring people of all ages from around the state and indeed the regional New South Wales to the MCA to, to take part in workshops with our incredible team of artist educators. We don't have teachers, we have artists who we train as educators essentially. And so children, young people and older people with disabilities or with particular needs can come to the museum and learn about, take part, be creative themselves, look at exhibitions, be inspired, think about how the world can be different and how it relates to their lives. And of course, obviously with young people and with our, for example, our art and dementia program with the carers, it's just as important for the carers and the people who are working with children, with families with disabilities, that they have these opportunities. And so what we've now developed is what we call our social impact stream, where art goes beyond something lovely that you do at the weekends or something where you want to learn something or something challenging. It is actually about how it makes a difference to people's lives. And I think that's incredibly important for the museum. That's what we've been honing in the last few years, thinking about how we articulate this. And it runs from our program we've done for the under fives. We know that creativity really matters to the development of the under fives, right through to art and dementia and everything in between. And one of my favorite moments is without doubt when you see a group of children coming into the museum and you see their faces light up when they look at this incredible place, the building, the art, the opera house, the harbor, uh, they may never have seen Sydney like that before. And to see it through the, they see, see things through the lens of art to me is incredibly important to them. And that will stay with them for all of their lives. I have no doubt about it. And uh, that program, as you, as you said, started out as, as, a, as a, uh, a way of bringing kids from Western Sydney who otherwise wouldn't find their way to the MCA, um, to the MCA. Um, that's only part of your engagement with Western Sydney, which started pretty soon after, after you arrived. Um, 
Can you tell us some of what you think about Western Sydney after after 22 years in, in terms of its of its potential for Sydney and, and its creative potential for Sydney? Well, I never thought about it in terms of East and West really until I, I accepted an invitation to go and open an exhibition in Blacktown. And within a few hours had my then assistant telling me I couldn't possibly go there on a train because it was dangerous and all this. And I, it, was, it was extraordinary to me. And of course, when I went there, I loved it because I felt like I was back in Birmingham. You know, it was culturally diverse. There were curry houses. There was a great sense of energy. There were really interesting artists doing things. So I immediately responded to Western Sydney. For me, it was never, a, you know, it was never, a, I didn't need to change my perception of it. But I realized very quickly how how we could play a role in changing Eastern Sydney's perception of it, but also more importantly, how we could genuinely engage and form partnerships. I mean, there was a, there isn't there is and was an incredible network of galleries there. So it was it was obvious to me that the MCA should be part and should be partnering those galleries uh, using what we could bring to a partnership, perhaps an international uh, focus. Um, or more resources or whatever it was to actually do things in collaboration. So that's how what we call the C3 West program was born. It was really collaborating with our, our colleagues in Western Sydney. And that in turn helped to change the image of the MCA and also helped to change the image of Western Sydney in a, in a sense, um, which was wrong. I mean, there, were, there have always been incredible um, artistic and, and cultural movements out there. I mean, look, you just need to look at Penrith and the Lures collection. It's hardly, you know, it's hardly mm. recent. Um, but also Casula Powerhouse, Campbelltown, Campbelltown um, you know, an incredible uh, network of galleries and people who've worked out there um, and been very committed to the same things that we were at the museum. So I've always believed that there is one Sydney and it should absolutely never be thought of in those terms of East and West. And I thought that game changer moment when Lucy Turnbull talked about central Sydney as being Parramatta um, was, was terrific, just to rethink the geography of the city like that. And I like to think we've played a role in that. Um, um, I've got a few more questions. I'm just gonna invite people who are watching, if you have any questions that you'd like to um, ask Lizanne if you want to um, type those into the Q&A function and I'll do my best to um, spot the good ones and, and, and uh, in the time that we have um, ask those questions of Lizanne. Um, what do you see Lizanne as, what have been the, the challenges for Sydney as a city? Um, so not just step away from the MCA and, and the cultural sector for a while. Um, as, as someone who's moved a lot around the city and engaged with lots of different parts of the city, what, what, what are the things that have struck you about Sydney um, that you would have liked us to have done better? Well, I've just mentioned one of them. I think the divide between East and West, which is, is, is clearly changing and is really important. And uh, I mean, there is a, one of these days there is a book to be written about how Western Sydney saved the MCA, in fact, um, because clearly politically Western Sydney is so important. Yeah. Um, so I think that's really that's really important. And also the whole the whole global reputation. Um, when I came, people said to me, oh, you'll never get support for a contemporary art museum. You know, it should be in Melbourne. That's where all the great ideas are. Sydney's the fun loving, you know, goes to the beach, superficial city. And um, that has changed a lot um, in the last few years. And I think, um, dare I say it, the fact that you gave me that global award actually is a sign of that. Um, that Sydney is not just the harbour. I mean, how often have we heard that mantra recently from um, various people that Sydney is not just the harbour and the beautiful views. Sydney is um, great food, great culture, great diversity. Uh, and I think those three things are the things that I would be really pushing for Sydney, that when people come here, I mean, when I came here, people were horrified. My colleagues in the, in the UK thought I was completely mad. I was going to a country where basically it was all about sport. Um, and that's another thing I like to do, bring together, as you well know, Michael, I'm a, a very big fan of, this, of the Swans. Um, and I have been known to go to the old rugby match as well. So both league and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, and um and let's watch the wallabies. So it's it's important that we that we position ourselves as a sophisticated city that encompasses all of these things. 
Um, and I think sometimes we do fall back into that default mode of, oh, look, there's a picture of the Opera House. And uh, it's very easy to do it. I, I've, I've heard so often them say, we'll do a campaign about Sydney and we'll move away from that. And then you see the campaign and there it is again, yeah, yeah, sitting yeah. on balconies, drinking wine, nice food, looking at the Opera House. Uh, and we, so we have to keep saying there is a soul to this city. It is not just about the superficial beauty and um, much as we love it. So how are those friends responding now um, as you step down from the most, from the most visited contemporary art <laughs> museum in the world? <laughs> well, funnily enough, since we set up our Tate program um, with money from Qantas a few years ago to co-acquire Australian work for Tate, who at the time had only two contemporary Australian artists, they now have 28. Um, at that point, only one of the Tate curators had ever been to Sydney. And now I think it's something like nine Tate staff have been. So Sydney has, all, Australia indeed has always suffered from the distance. You know, it is that little bit further than, you know, going off to, you know, China or Brazil or, you know, everywhere. When, when the art world discovered that there was art outside London and New York, which happened in the, in the 80s and nine, early 90s. Um, so Australia was a bit of a late, a late comer to that, but definitely um, people absolutely talk about coming to Australia now and uh, without any, any problem. And we've seen the results of that with Australian artists being shown much more uh, in international exhibitions because the curators come here and they're actually realising what an incredible uh, range and diversity of work there is, not just at Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, but in, in all fields of, of contemporary art. So we've got some questions. Um coming in on the chat now. A, a lot of them are about what you're going to do next. So let's, <laughs> let's park those, let's park those to closer to the end. Um, there's there's a couple of others here, which I, I think are, are, are really significant questions. They, they go to um, uh, picking up the fact that you, you've always enjoyed great success in securing philanthropic support and other kinds of funding for the MCA. Um, but contrasting that with um, the current position of smaller cultural organisations, particularly post-COVID. What, what are your thoughts on how the sector might resuscitate itself um, um, as we um, come out of a succession of lockdowns? That's such a good question. I mean, I think that it's so important that um, the role of the arts in getting us beyond this is recognised by government. And I did take on the... Um, somewhat difficult task of chairing the federal government's task force uh, in, 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 into the cultural arts and entertainment sector. And I think it's really interesting to try and make sure that the role of the arts, not just in terms of the economy, the economy is one thing, and I think CBDs, the role of the MCA and other cultural institutions in reawakening the CBD, encouraging people back, come back to the office, go to the MCA at lunchtime, and that, of course, brings me to the second point, which is the role of the arts in, in, in health and well-being. And so I think there is an incredible opportunity for all organizations, not just the bigger ones, but the smaller ones as well, to be very clear in their messaging to their supporters and to the wider public that they have a role to play. Come in and check it out. Take, a, take half an hour out of your working day. Come down. We've learned now that we really have to have this life work balance a bit better. And part of that is looking after yourself, not just looking after your, your family or, your, or whoever you're caring for, but actually self, looking after yourself, taking that time. And we're better to do that than in somewhere like the MCA at lunchtime or, or after work. You know, our late night Fridays are going to be, I think, a big factor connecting into the rocks. And I think that the role of these institutions is, is going to be critical. And how we do that is having people like me and other staff in the organizations talking about it like this, because they are the best ambassadors for an organization. So you don't need a huge capital campaign. You don't need a huge philanthropic campaign. You just need to be explaining to your supporters why art goes beyond just what's on the walls. It goes into the social impact I was talking about earlier, but also well-being. And I think that's going to be our mantra for, for the future. Um as I said, I'm going to keep what's next for you until the end, but um, let's ask about what's, what's next for, um, for Sydney. And, and here, what I'd like to get, I suppose, is, is what, what would be um, 
your ambition for this city that you've invested so much of your life in and and what would be your challenge for us i think the i think the re, the, the reawakening of the cbd is critical there's been so much discussion about the end of the cbd etc cetera, etc cetera, and i think that is just not not right it's not going to happen and it shouldn't happen and so the role of the city the cbd and all the wonderful things we've been talking about the cultural institutions the opera house everything needs to come together in in one big collaboration if i could say something slightly critical it is that i don't think sydney up until now has been a very collaborative city um, and I think that's because it's been a bit complacent in the past. Um, I worked in Birmingham for 10 years, as you know, and I was used to working very closely with colleagues in different, um, in different arts, art forms. That doesn't happen so much here. Everybody's in their buckets or in their little pockets. Uh, and I think there's a great opportunity, and it's happening now, to bring together the arts, the hotels, um, the restaurants, um, and really genuinely work together. Destination New South Wales... Um, is doing some great work in the in this area and i know create is interested in it too that we really work collaboratively it's not every we can't survive being everybody for themselves uh, and it's very easy for politicians to dismiss us if as a sector our we are not first of all making the argument for our wider significance and secondly working collaboratively with colleagues outside our, our immediate sphere so to me, the opportunity for the future is to be a truly collaborative city. And I think originally I would have said 10 or 15 years ago, Melbourne does that better. Uh, I think it's happening here, but I think there's quite a way to go yet. And what do you think sits behind that? Is it, is it the nature of funding? Is, it, um, is there a competitiveness for philanthropic support? Is it, is it just that people don't have the habit? What, what, what is it? It's, it's, it has been complacency. Right. I think it's been complacency. And it, it, I think if I think back to Birmingham, it was like Birmingham against London. I think Melbourne's been successful because it's defined itself. We have to do this together because we have to be better than Sydney, whereas Sydney doesn't give a damn about Melbourne, really, or it hasn't done until recently. It's beginning to, you know, I think that's changed more recently. But that certainly was how it felt when I first came. It was a sense of complacency. We're all right. We've got the harbour. And um, we've got a few great cultural institutions and we've got the harbour. So a, a sense of complacency has, has been uh, very clear. But as I say, I think that has changed enormously in the last few years. But there's a long way to go. And where do you think we are on the, on the cultural map? And I'm thinking less now about how well we compete with Melbourne and how we might compete with Singapore or Hong Kong or Shanghai or, or you know, San Francisco. Well, I think we're getting there. Um, I think that um, the, the, the huge government investment in, in infrastructure, obviously, that the, the launch of Sydney Modern next year is going to be a game changer, as long as there is also money for artists and for programs. And that worries me. I think like many governments, Australia is no different, that uh, it's very easy to fund infrastructure and not so easy to fund um, to fund the running costs. I mean, to think about the idea that we've now got this fabulous, fabulous opportunity with two powerhouse sites, one in, in Ultimo and the incredible project out in Parramatta, which I think everybody knows I've been a huge champion of right from the very beginning. I mean, that's amazing. And that that's another game changer. So these kinds of big symbols I think really are uh, are important, even though I've, I've never been one to champion buildings as a way of solving things, but buildings are simply a vehicle for, for great things to happen, to bring people and art together. Uh, and what will happen, what, what the challenge I think for, for Sydney going forward is to make sure that the expectations of those great pieces of infrastructure are actually delivered in programs and that it doesn't at the same time uh, prevent the development of the smaller medium to scale sector or investment in the artists. It cannot be either or. You have to have a holistic uh, art scene. And, and that would worry me a little bit that politicians get very interested in the big glamorous projects and less interested in, in, in what feeds into them and makes those really lively happening places because they can't exist in isolation at the top of the tree. Well, that ties in pretty nicely to a uh, a question from Jess Scully, which um, uh, refers back to the C3 West um, project and is asking, you know, what else can be done to push past the, the inner city bubble and to, to enliven and engage, well, maybe not enliven the sector, but to engage the broader community with 
the sector beyond um, the inner city? Well, I do think it's back to collaboration. I really do. I think there's strength in numbers. I think more organizations working together um, and working with artists. I mean, I think that, you know, we've talked a lot about audience, but actually the museum stands or falls by its commitment to artists. And one of the things I've loved most about my my leaving has been the incredible um, emails I've had from artists saying just how important the museum is to them. And I think that it's it, it's joining the dots again. You can't have a thriving artistic community without a thriving MCA, you know? So you can't fund one at the expense of the other. And I think that's important. It's, I, I think this holistic view of the arts sector is, it, I can't stress it enough. And very often we think it's either community or high art, if you like. And my passion all my life has been to say there is no such distinction. You know, that's why C3 West matters, because we bring artists to work in community, to look at issues of interest, to bring artistic thinking to situations. Um, they're the same artists that we might well show in the gallery. There isn't a distinction. Uh, and so it's really important to have that breadth of artistic practice that goes from community arts right through to, you know, a major summer Sydney International Arts Series exhibition like Doug Aitken and that we're putting together at the moment. Um, another question here, if you look back across the uh, 22 years, um, what are the things um, from the life of the museum that, that really sit most firmly in, in your, your mind, the things that you're most proud of or the things that were most extraordinary? Well, it's a little unusual for me to say this because I've always been a bit against buildings for the sake of buildings, but actually the building was a game changer, not because of the building, much as I love the building, but because of what it allowed us to do. It was never about more gallery space or getting bigger or, or making bigger exhibitions. It was always about better facilities and better engagement with the audience and the provision of the facilities in the National Centre for Creative Learning. I think that's been critical to have dedicated facilities at the heart of the museum, not stuck in the basement where education facilities often are, but actually at the heart of the museum with those great views for children and young people. Um, there was a critic who sneered about giving you know, school classrooms with views in a museum, which I, I really despised at the time. And it's so wrong because you don't need views when you're in the gallery. In the gallery, you're looking at art. So to provide really great facilities um, and a great experience for all of our visitors, whether they're, you know, a visitor with a disability or, or someone who just pops in from the street or someone who's an art expert, we want the facilities to provide them the best possible experience. Um, there are those who think we should have knocked the building down and rebuilt it. I wasn't one of those. As many people will know, that was a very interesting part of our history when the then Lord Mayor went off on that tangent, which was very well intentioned to provide us with more money, but um, ultimately, I think, ill-advised. But the extension really has, has transformed us. And, uh, and without the major philanthropy from the Mordaunt family, that simply wouldn't have happened. Partnering, of course, with three levels of government um, which is quite unusual in this in this city. That's probably something else I should say is I, I one of the things that very, very difficult is the the the, the lack of collaboration between um, between the three levels of government, which was something I found quite difficult when I came because I was used to it being much not easier, but but just more under, uh, it was just more accepted that even different political persuasions of levels of government in the UK did tend to work together when it came to the arts. And I think that's a hard, a harder job in this country. I think as a consumer of, of, um, of art, you, you have these moments where you walk into a museum and you, you see something and you think, oh, that's it. Okay, I can stop now. You know, <laughs> <laughs> for me, I think that was, uh, as I've mentioned to you in the past, uh, during the Pipilotti wrist exhibition, yeah. um, uh, I just remember walking and thinking, okay, I can stop now. Um, <laughs> was, was there a moment when you went, okay, my work is done. This is it. This is well, I was, I was, yeah, I, I, there were several of those. I mean, early on, I guess, um, you know, I, I, I did Tracy Moffat's first major exhibition. I, I couldn't, frankly, I was astonished that she hadn't had a major exhibition. I think it took us until 2005 or six to do it. But um, I loved working on that exhibition. Maria Fernanda Cardoza was another one. And I guess when I managed to do the Anish Kapoor and the, the point of the Anish Kapoor was not just that it was an amazing, he is incredible. And I, yeah. I, I, I actually had him on my bus all those years ago, but 
what it meant for me was there were still those people kind of going, oh, they should have knocked the building down. You know, the galleries are terrible. They've got, you know, you know, I mean, the late great Edmund Capon, you know, once famously walked through going, look at all those pillars, McGregor, you've got to get rid of them. And uh, and actually to do a show of an uh, of a sculpture of his caliber and him to love it, to me said a lot that it was about working with a building, working with an artist and making the best possible use of your building and actually the columns didn't matter because you could actually do amazing things. And um, we had of course created those fabulous big galleries, the one downstairs and, and the two double height spaces. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit paraphrasing this one, but you know what I mean? It was really about saying this building works, this building works for art. And if one of the greatest sculptors in the, wor in the world, in my view, Anish Kapoor, is very happy working here, then why not? In fact, we've never had an artist complain and we've had, you know, William Kentridge, uh, we've got Doug Aitken coming, Cornelia Parker, Pippolotti Rist you've mentioned, um, and many, many Australians, of course, and I don't hear them complaining about the building. So um, I think what we did was the right thing. Um, there are a lot of questions coming in um, following your teaser about the Tate. So people people want to know more about, about that collaboration who they're hanging um, and, yeah. and where, you, where, where that's heading. I, I'm, I was so excited about this program. I mean, essentially it came out of some money that Quant Qantas was winding up its foundation. It had a corpus of money, which it actually got from selling its collection many years ago. And they asked for some ideas and they were talking about doing exhibitions internationally. And I just said, no, I think the biggest challenge for Australian artists is to be bought by international museums. And it's simply not happening. So I literally picked up the phone to Nicholas Sorota at the Tate and I said, how would you respond to a co-acquisition program? Because of course we wanted something out of it. And he said, what a great idea. So we, we set it up and uh, Qantas funded it. Uh, 28 artists, there's another round coming. Uh, they began showing them almost immediately. And I was worried about that because I thought they could just sit in the basement forever in their storage. But in fact, Gordon Bennett's work went up very quickly. Juan de Villa's work went up, Maria Fernanda Cardozo. Uh, and now, right now, they have an entire display of work um, from the mostly from the co-acquisition. There are a couple of other works added to it, which are based, is based around the idea of native title, uh, not just Aboriginal artists, but uh, incredible. And that's going to be up for a year. So if any of us get to London before next next June, I think, um, you'll have an opportunity to see it. And it's had a really, really great response, fantastic write-ups, um, financial review, and, and so on. So it's, it's really terrific. Some of you will remember there was a very ill-fated exhibition at the Royal Academy a few years ago that got absolutely slammed. It was completely the wrong context and the wrong kind of exhibition. And I'm very pleased that this much more measured integrated approach where basically the curators have come and informed themselves about Australian art and are now presenting it alongside our international peers so it's uh, yeah it's it's pretty exciting um, one thing I know you will understand because of the deep interest you have had in indigenous art over such a long time is that relationship between landscape and culture um, absolutely um, how, how do you how do you feel that relationship sits in Sydney now? Um, so Sydney's relationship with its First Nations people, Sydney's relationship with its own landscape. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's changed enormously. I mean, one of the things I think is so fantastic, I mean, I, I'd like to, to pay tribute to Emily McDaniel here, who also got one of your wonderful awards, the Emerging Leader Award. And Emily has done the most fantastic job uh, with the city of Sydney and this, this really inspiring walk that we're going to have with various incredible artworks not just big public artworks but talking about you know walking the land and learning about it from an average and Torres Strait Islander perspective so I think the city of Sydney has done some incredible work in this in this area and deserves the credit for it and um, the naming of, of spaces is so important um, artworks are so important the storytelling is so important so I, th I think we have changed a lot and then obviously in the galleries, we, you know, Sydney Modern is going to have a huge presence uh, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander work. The Australian Museum where Emily now works, uh, sorry, um, the powerhouse where Emily now works likewise. And the Australian Museum just uh, had an incredible exhibition. So 
weaving the story for me it's more interesting than having a separate venue quite frankly I mean there's been a lot of talk about let's have a Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander you know gallery and that's that's one aspiration but I actually think again back to collaboration we could do so much more if we could jointly promote all these activities to both our own citizens and also to to our international visitors. There's a couple of questions about um, arts and education. So um, some of them touching on the, the role of um, arts education in ensuring that our city is a creative city. Um, and also um, some, some questions that touch on, you know, whether we've overemphasized STEM in the education system um, at, at the expense of- oh, STEAM. Um, <laughs> that's right. Do, Thoughts on thoughts on how we're dealing with education? Uh, well, I, I have to say that um, the curriculum in New South Wales is for the visual arts is is really good, and I was incredibly impressed when I came here. My colleague Jill Nicholl, who's our, our director of public engagement, likewise came from the UK, and we were really impressed at the number of artists, contemporary artists that are on the curriculum. So there's some really good things about it here. During the discussions about the national curriculum, it became very problematic because the visual arts could easily have been watered down, but that doesn't seem to have happened. And um, the STEAM versus STEM argument, absolutely, that's at, at federal level as well. And, and I know many teachers around the country and in New South Wales really want to push the arts. So if you talk with, I mean, you've heard um, amazing principals at various Bella dinners talking about the importance of art and how it it contributes to not just children's learning, but their sense of engagement, uh, not with school, but also with Australia. So I think the arts needs to, we need to not lose sight of the fact that it really should be STEAM, not STEM, uh, as it is in other countries. There's still a bit of work to be done, but at school level and at the New South Wales curriculum level, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the visual arts and, and the way in which it's developed. Um, another question around, what's been learnt during COVID that we shouldn't unlearn uh, mm -hmm. on the other side. So what, 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 what have been features of the museum's outreach and programming that, that you would think should stay once COVID's done? Well, of course we jumped, the obvious answer is digital. We, we were doing a lot of it already, a lot of most museums were, and we did it, we did a lot more and we've done, we've done it better. And I think we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot about doing things more spontaneously rather than the big film, you know, the video that has to be pre-recorded and all that, doing this kind of thing. My director to collector series, my director to director series around the world. So greater connectivity globally and giving access to that, I think has been important. But the big learning for us was how many children do not have access, easy access to the internet. It sounds crazy, but 40% of the primary children that we were dealing with did not have easy access to the internet. So we started working on sending out actual uh, activity sheets and parcels with things that kids could do. We, we paired with the Daily Telegraph to do um, the activities for their hiber hibernate section so that you could you know, get, get uh, inspiration from the newspaper around creativity. So we mustn't forget that the digital world divides into the haves and the have nots, and that's not gonna change in a hurry. And so if we don't want to continue to exacerbate those um, you know, what people with money have access to, as opposed to people who may not have so much money have access to, we mustn't just focus on the digital. And so ironically, I think that's one of our big learnings coming, coming out of this. And of course, the importance of the real, you know, that, that actually connection, coming together, the social experience of being around art is what we're all missing. And what we saw last time when we reopened with our, dare I say it, my fabulous Lindy Lee exhibition that I curated, um, that, that the outpouring of people coming back and loving that exhibition, which, which did, dealt with so many pertinent issues around racism, around living between two cultures, around living with the natural world, um, the importance of art to, to, to speak for those things that perhaps scientists haven't managed to get across. Can art do a better job? We'll see. All right, so we're up to the what next phase and I'm not going to ask you um, what next for the MCA because I know you don't want to be that outgoing director um, <laughs> who, who keeps popping up. Um, what, what, what next for you? And I suppose what's sitting behind a lot of these questions about what next is um, a hope that Sydney is not losing you. So um, 
What are, what are your plans? Well, Sydney may lose me because, but New South Wales won't. So um, just physically, I, I, I'm not planning to live in Sydney, but I will be living in New South Wales and I will be visiting Sydney. I, I, I feel that I need a complete break and I think it's better for my successor that I'm not kind of peering over her shoulder and uh, turning up at openings and so on. So that's different for me. I have a lot of other interests. I'm, I have a great interest in conservation. I'm a scuba diver. I have a great interest in, in the marine environment. Um, I'm hoping to get involved in, in things like that. Um, I'm never going to give up my passion for the Sydney Swans. I'm on the Swans Foundation. We have the Royal Hall of Industries campaign going. Um, my good friend Peter Ivany keeps picking my brains about how to tap into perhaps arts and sports fans for that. So my philanthropy may not disappear completely. I will always have artists as friends and I will always be engaged in some way, but I'm not going to be engaged in it professionally. And um, so some time in New South Wales, any time overseas, are you going to... Uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I, absolutely. I'm going back to see my family. Um, we're not going to live in Scotland. It's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not where my base would be, but I will be spending time there. Um, I also speak Italian. We, I've always had a... I spent a lot of time in Italy when I was younger and I was studying and I, I, I love um, spending time there. So my partner and I may well spend a bit of time in Italy, but... Uh, um, I think in terms of other other interests, you know, I joke about maybe I'll just run a wombat sanctuary. <laughs> <laughs> Something completely different. But then who knows, as someone said to me the other day, you may feel different in three months, but uh, we'll see. It'll be uh, it'll be interesting. I think 22 years here, 10 years before that. In fact, the icon is very nice. I just received yesterday the book that the icon have done on my decade. And yeah, I felt a bit teary, actually, but it was quite nice to see that acknowledged. I did that building there and. And, and really changed the way um, that gallery thought about uh, about diversity, essentially, with lots of artists from different culture backgrounds. Uh, and so I'm never going to lose that. That's my uh, those that 30 years plus the bus are pretty much my uh, that's my contribution. And I suppose you've always got your bus driver's license. So. <laughs> <laughs> I used to joke like that when things were really rocky at the museum when I was fighting with various people I used to say well if it all goes horribly wrong I can go back to driving a bus but uh, <laughs> I'm not sure that my license is actually valid any, lo any longer to be honest with you but I, I am toying with writing a book but we'll see about um, just the lessons learned about you know to go from under a hundred thousand to over a million visitors is I look back on that and think, wow, I could never have predicted that. I remember arguing with a certain politician about what our numbers should be and uh, lots of kind of huffing and puffing and you need at least half a million visitors. And me thinking, how on earth am I going to get to a half a million visitors? Um, and we did. Within six years, we did. And that was what really stimulated the discussion about the expansion because people, the foyers were inadequate. You had two school groups and people couldn't get in the front door. Uh, and so the inadequacies of the building had to be addressed eventually to allow us to really fly. But going forward for the museum, I, I, I don't think I'm talking a lot with colleagues about the numbers and the numbers game. Really, we need to get over it. What matters is who comes and how they engage. Uh, we don't want to revert to some kind of elitism where only a small number come. But actually, that million figure, you know, may never be achieved again. And I don't think that's such a problem. I think what matters is, is how, how people engage, who comes, how we reach out, um, the, the slowing down. A, a friend of mine in Italy compared it to slow food, you know, local, local ingredients, um, not fast food, um, taking time, um, not rushing through an exhibition, um, maybe coming looking at one work rather than trying to see a whole exhibition. Which, of course, brings us back to the whole importance of a museum being free. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget the fact that Telstra backed us doing that right at the beginning. It was extraordinary for a corporate to come in when we were actually still not off the front pages of the newspaper. And they came in with the, with free access. And it was just it transformed us, absolutely transformed us. I, I did have a lot of sleepless nights, I must say. I was very worried about it because people said, Oh, why are you opening? Why are you going free with the Biennale of Sydney? You know, that's also all that weird art. You know, you shouldn't you go in with something like, you know, why don't you do a nice photography exhibition or a landscape show that everybody will understand? And I said to my then head of marketing, no, we're going to back contemporary art. And back it we did. And immediately 
you know, the, the atmosphere in the museum changed and it, and, and it was fantastic. And you see that all the time now. Young people have grown up with it. I had someone say to me the other day, I've grown up with the MCA. It's yep. part of my life. Yep. And that's great. You know, we're no longer this kind of weird organization, weird museum that does funny things, you know. Naked girls in lifts. Some of you will remember the <laughs> famous <laughs> performance and... Uh, you know, wrapping, build, wrapping cliffs and all that kind of weird stuff that people used to talk to me about. We don't, it's not like that anymore. It really has changed quite remarkably. Um, Lizanne, you've been a great ambassador for Sydney and that's not going to stop just because you're not here all the time and people are going to ask you, tell us about Sydney now. What, what is it you'll tell them? Oh, it's a great city. And you know, you just move away from the harbour, you go up, you've got carriage works, you've got, you know, you've got go west, go to Parramatta. I have no doubt that Parramatta is going to grow and develop into an incredible centre and it will no longer be a joke that Parramatta is the centre of Sydney. Um, I think that the, the extraordinary diversity, the food um, and of course the art, you know, there's, there's so many different things um, springing up, artist run initiatives, you've got first draft down in Woolloomooloo art space. Um, and then, you know, Parramatta Artist Studios. Um, I, I've mentioned, you know, Penrith Regional Gallery, beautiful place to go for a day out and have a, you know, have a nice lunch. Campbelltown with its fabulous Chinese, uh, Japanese garden and its cafe. I mean, it's, it's an amazing, amazing city. And uh, I hope that we, are, we, we will always love the Opera House, but there's so much more. And, uh, and what we want to do is get people to spend more time here, not just uh, shoot off to to anywhere else in Australia, but stay in Sydney, stay and explore Sydney. It's it's an amazing place. And I'm I'm finding things out about it. And I've been here for 22 years. Well, Lizanne, we're out of time. I think I've got to most questions or most groups of, of questions. There's um there's a lot of love in the questions and in the chat. Um, uh, one of the great things I think about Sydney is that people can come here from other places around the world and instantly start making a difference um, if they're really good at what they do and bold and ambitious as, as you have been. And you've made an extraordinary difference for our city, an extraordinary difference to the lives of anybody who's um, enjoyed the MCA or any of its programs. Um, uh, and so on behalf of all the people who are watching and all the people who have enjoyed the museum and its programs over so many years, um, Congratulations, and thank you very much. And thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Michael. And if anyone wants to email me with questions I didn't get to, please feel free. I think there were a couple of our, our names I, I recognized and, uh, oh, there's John Go. So I'd like to say thank you, John, for your participation and everything we've done. John's the, the principal of Maryland's East and one of our most fabulous uh, collaborators in Western Sydney. All right, well, thank you, Lizanne. Bon voyage. Thank and, you. Um, <laughs> I've yeah. got a few more weeks to do. I'm getting out of lockdown and I'm opening the Doug Aiken show. So I'll be here for a while yet. All right. See you at the Swannies next year. Absolutely. Go Swannies. Bye. Right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. See you next time.